Hi, everyone. Welcome to our annual reading festival. My name is Angela Senegalia, and I will be your host this evening. Um, we are very delighted to welcome Alefo Deng and Judy Bernstein as our authors. Um, for those of you who are joining us tonight who are students at the Community Learning Center or in one of our non-credit programs, um, perhaps you're reading one of their books in your classes with your teachers. And so we're very excited to not only um, welcome two published authors to our space, but also to give you as students the opportunity to learn maybe um, a little bit of history that you don't already know, um, or to learn about um, a story about a refugee from another country to our San Diego County um, and some of the different themes that they'll share with us tonight. So. On behalf of the um, faculty and staff at the Community Learning Center, um, I welcome you um, and I hope that you enjoy tonight's presentation. I'm going to start by introducing Judy so she can share a little bit with you and then we will have Aleppo um, talk to you about his stories and his journey and then we will save some time at the end for questions and answers. So you are welcome to use the chat features um, or the question feature to um, hold a space or to share your um, thoughts or ideas. And when we are um, ready to welcome those, we will help you ask questions and say hello to our authors. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Judy Bernstein. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank Angela and Maria for bringing us here. It's really an honor. And I really want to thank all of you um, who have read our book and uh, those of you who are attending tonight. Uh, we're really honored to have you hear our stories and uh, share in this whole experience. I'd like to talk, before I introduce Alefo, I'd like to talk a little bit about stories and their importance. If you think about a story um, that's a true story that somebody has told about their life, you know, it's a lot like time travel because it takes you to a time that you had never been before. It takes you to a place you haven't been and you actually get to stand in the shoes of that person. My um, co-author, Alephonse On, came up in a completely different part of the world halfway around the earth in Sudan at a different time and certainly in a different place in the middle of war. And so when I heard about their story, I was, it was unimaginable to me. And, uh, and then I was so lucky I got to meet him, you know, not too long after that. But what I'd like to start out with tonight is reading a little bit from the book that we did together, because for me, it brings up the importance of stories. Alefo, um, as some of you know, ended up trekking uh, for three years when war came to his village when he was only seven years old and crossed a thousand miles of Sudan and finally found safety at a refugee camp in Kenya where he lived for nine years. But this uh, section I'm going to read from our book was on his journey uh, soon after he had left. And keep in mind, he's seven years old and he's with a group of other boys and soldiers and they're running through war. So he writes, we rested there, but the soldiers told us not to walk out of town because there were landmines. Joseph, who's his cousin, started to cook. A few minutes later, the soldiers announced, okay, boys, we're going. Once more, we didn't eat. We passed more towns, all ruined wrecked buildings, wrecked cars. They looked like battlefields and smelled of human blood. Seeing destroyed towns changed our mood. They didn't even look like villages anymore. I thought I understood why they attacked our village. They wanted our cattle, our things, and our kids. But I didn't understand this complicated war, how it mortally devoured the land and left it so full of skeletons. The adults talked of the war all the time. They discussed slavery, apartheid, racism, segregation, and tribalism. They called it a religious war. I heard all the words, but I didn't understand them. I think kids feel differently about things than adults do. From what I could see, 
men or women, children or adults, young or aged, rich or poor, war was making everyone equal. So, you know, when we hear things on the news, of course, lately, I'm sure all of you have, you know, heard about what's going on in Ukraine. You know, we hear about how many people were killed. We hear about the soldiers. We hear about the headlines, the bombs. But we really don't get to hear from the voices of the children and the people, you know, suffering in those situations. When I was in high school um, and early in college, the uh, United States was involved in a war in Vietnam. And my friends and my cousins were being drafted into the war to go fight. And on the news every night, we'd hear how many people were killed, mostly just Americans. And we would hear that um, we had to stop communism. And we would hear that the Viet Cong in, in uh, Vietnam you know, were the bad people. We were fighting these bad people called the Viet Cong. But it was years later that I read a book, and actually she's a San Diego author, Lely Hayslip, and she wrote a book called When Heaven and Earth Change Places. So when I was in high school, Lely was a little girl in Vietnam, and she lived on a farm. And by day, they were on the side of Americans. But at night, the Viet Cong would come, and they would have to tell them they were Viet Cong. And so she lived in this scary world of somebody making a mistake and saying who they were. And for me, reading that book completely changed how I felt about what had happened in Vietnam and how I felt about the refugees that were coming here. I saw how complex their life were, was and what struggles they, they endured just to get here. So these kinds of stories, these true stories, um, really put us in the shoes and the time of those people who have gone through things like this. So I know you all want to meet my co-author, Alefo. Um, he had the courage, because it takes a lot of courage when you first come here, especially from a country who doesn't want you telling the stories, um, to start telling his story right away. He started the first day I met him. He, the thing he wanted to buy in Walnut was a composition book. And right away he started writing. And uh, those little stories and those notes um, became a book. His English improved and eventually he even wrote a second book. So anybody can tell their stories and stories are so important. They really change people's perspective around the world. So Alefo is going to speak with you guys for a while and share some of his stories and some of the photos that uh, of the things in his life. So I'd like to introduce you now, my co-author, Alefonsi Onding. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much. My name is Alefo Ding, and uh, I am the co-author of uh, They Poured Fire on Us from the Sky, and uh, also the co-author of Disturbed in the Nest. I want to thank Angela for putting this together, for bringing us uh, to be part of uh, uh, this evening uh, event, to, to share stories, to communicate with uh, everyone of, that has come to hear us. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit how um, some of you might have read the book and uh, uh, you, you understand my journey. But I'm going to tell you a little bit um, how I where I was born and how I grew up. I was born in South Sudan. Um, I was born... I was born in... Uh, back then it was called... Uh, the country was called Sudan, uh, and then after the the civil war erupted, uh, which led to uh, the story that you're reading, uh, I was displaced. Uh, at least four million people were displaced uh, during the civil war, and it was a war between uh, North and South. Uh, so the North is uh, predominantly Muslim, 
And then the cells comprise of uh, at least 64 tribes, different tribes. They don't speak the same uh, language. They have several dialects. And uh, the official language uh, is English and Arabic. So um, the root of it all, uh, it's been said it has to do with uh, resources, uh, power, uh, you know, was power struggles, also religion. So that's <clears throat> what led to my story. I would not be in the United States uh, if it wasn't for the Civil War. Uh, I've never dreamt about coming to the United States or migrating. I love where I was born. I was born in a, a, in a small village. Uh, my father. You can, you can click to that. This one? Yeah. So this is my village. It, look, it looks like this. This is how I was, I was, where I was born. We didn't have electric, electricity. We didn't have running water. Uh, we didn't have TV. We didn't have, in fact, we didn't have books. So the, my way of learning as a child was my father told us stories. Uh, at night after dinner, my father would tell us stories uh, around fire. Uh, and uh, a lot of those stories, those were a way of learning uh, my former education. So um, <clears throat> we kept cattle, we kept uh, animals, sheep, goats. And uh, so this is, so I was gonna be that small boy you see uh, next to that big bull. So that's uh, actually the way of life. That's the way uh, you know we, 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 we benefit so much from uh, milk that the cattle provide. We use cow dung uh, for many things. It's used as manure. Uh, I think you call it fertilizers. Uh, we also use urine as uh, as uh, uh, chemicals. You know, we use urine, uh, cow, cow's urine for cleaning. Uh, there's nothing wasted when it comes to. Uh, so uh, we are very good cattle keepers. Uh, that's the way I was going to uh, grow up. Um, but when the, the Civil War came, uh, all that I knew uh, was destroyed. So this is uh, some of the toys I had when I was a kid. My favorite toys were like, I would make mud cows. You know, as you can see this kid right here, it's a, uh, have some mud cows. So uh, I would use uh, mud cows as toys. I also uh, collect snail shells and, you, uh, and use those as my toys to play with. Um, it was more like a free, Free life. Um, the responsibilities for a young child was mostly eat, sleep, play. And that was what I did a lot. Uh, some, some days my mother sent me to the neighbors to go collect fire from the, to get the fire. Uh, so those are like my chores, you know, just little things. <clears throat> um, when I, after I was displaced and I was in the refugee camp, so right here, I'm uh, on the on the left. That's my friend in the middle. That's my brother uh, on the right. Uh, this is in the refugee camp. This picture was taken in the refugee camp. And in the refugee camp, I didn't actually have clothes. The clothes I'm wearing, I borrowed those. I borrowed those clothes. And so in the refugee camp is where I actually studied my learning after fleeing the war. And I ended up in the refugee camp in Kenya. So I started learning. And we started learning under trees. And I remember I didn't like the idea of education. Uh, I didn't really, I didn't see any purpose in it. Uh, I also didn't understand why I have to learn another language, you know. But one day I, uh, I went to this community meeting and then I heard all these elders were discussing uh, about war and about many, many, many other issues that were going on in our community. And uh, I remember one man, older man, stood up and, and told these other people, he told them that they didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't understand uh, the reason that we were displaced from our homes and our home, homes burned down and destroyed was because we lacked something that was very important. And then the man said, 
the rest of the world have this thing. It's important. It's something that is, uh, it's magic. It makes you understand yourself. It makes you understand things in the skies and things under the earth. Uh, and so for the first time, and then he looked at me, he said, young man, go to school. You know, if you want to get the magic power to change your life and to change the world, go to school. So for the first time, my interest was piqued uh, and the desire uh, came on me and I decided to go to school and spend a lot of time learning under the trees, writing on the, uh, on the sand. We didn't have any books or pencil. Uh, it would be years later that the United Nations actually decided to help us with books. And um, so I remember the first time I held the book and it smelled so good, I actually was so happy. I remember the first time I learned how to write my name, it was exciting. And then the more I kept learning, the more I kept discovering uh, I didn't know until eight years later that 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 magic power was instilled in me that I actually uh, learned and mastered the English language and speak it and could write it. Now, um, coming to United States, I, 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 I became lucky because I met my co-author, Judy. She was a writer uh, already. And uh, not many people get lucky. Not many people get blessed like the way I was. Uh, as an immigrant, you migrated. A lot of people come to the United States. They don't get that lucky. I, I, I was super lucky to meet, to have met Judy Bernstein. Without her, I wouldn't actually have a book. I would have this story. I would still have my story, but I wouldn't have a book. And so uh, because of her, she encouraged us uh, that our, our story was important. And first we were saying, oh, you know, no one is, who, who wants to read our story? Nobody wants to read our story, you know? We weren't interested, you know? And she said, trust me, people would be interested to hear what you've been through, uh, what you learned, you know, through your journeys, through your struggles, you know? Uh, people will relate uh, and people will connect. And so uh, that was, a convincing idea, and she also said it would help expand our our worldview, uh, living in the United States. And so, certainly, I've been uh, truly, truly lucky to have not just have one book, but two books. Um, the other book is uh, I'll show you um, two books, and this is because US is one of those great countries that if you believed in yourself and you and you dreamed and you pursue your dream, you can always make something out of yourself. You can always change your life around. Uh, your past, your past life does not have to de determine your future. You know, you can determine your future. You can decide that I'm gonna make peace like what I did, I've been making peace with my past life, with the, uh, the trauma, the war trauma uh, and the tragedy and the death that I've seen uh, at a young age that actually traumatized my life to the maximum. But also uh, the thing about suffering, when you suffer, it kind of changes you, you know? It, 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 suffering will either embitter you uh, uh, and at the same time, the other uh, 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 the other token, it could also create in you a compassion, a forgiving uh, spirit. Uh, also, you could start to love other human beings. You don't have to get stuck, you know. And so I have always tried to come out from uh, from all that, you know, to be a better person, to have a purpose. Uh, in, in the world, in society. And so that's one reason that uh, I, I feel compelled to come out and to share my story with anyone that is interested, to wants to hear it. Uh, this is uh, when we first came to the United States and <laughs> we met our mentor, Judy Bernstein, my co-author, and she took us to the baseball game. This is my first base baseball uh, experience right here. 
So you can see I'm, I'm, I'm right there in the middle. I'm just kind of contemplating, I'm thinking. Not sure really what I was thinking, but I, I'm just wondering, you know. Uh, this is uh, my first apartment. And this is Judy's son is helping me how to learn a computer. First time learning about computer. Uh, this is San Diego Zoo. Uh, she took us to San Diego Zoo. We were explaining to her different kind of animals we have seen. Uh, also how a lion ate some of our friends who are telling her all those stories. Um, this is my first job uh, in America. I got a job at Ralph's and um, that was my first ever job. You know, I enjoyed working there. I was a, a bag boy, you know, had interesting experience there as well. Um, this is uh, my first, the first time I share my story. I went out to um, to, uh, to a school and uh, they asked me to tell the kids stories. And I told them these stories and they were super excited to hear them. They asked me so many questions. So this is the first time I, I told my story. At this point, I didn't publish the book yet. Uh, we didn't start, uh, we were still working on it. And that's, uh, that's the book. When the book was finished, that's my brother. I'm in the middle. That's my cousin. Uh, they are also uh, co-authors in the, in, the, in, the, in the book. And this is my second book. Uh, this is when it first came out, 2016, I mean 2018. So I got my first copy. Uh, you can see there, I'm happy, I'm smiling. You know, one thing about success, whenever you do something, and you succeed at it, it gives you great joy. There's great joy that comes with, uh, you know, having achieved something, having done something. You know, I think one of my biggest achievement in the United States is really having been blessed to meet uh, Judy Bernstein, which uh, allowed me to share my story in a way that I would not have if I didn't meet her. You know, I, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Now I've spoken to so many people, hundreds of schools uh, over the years, share the same stories, you know, changes all the time. Um, so it goes back to the cows. This is the first cow that I actually uh, bought for my mother, my elder mother, you know, is back in, 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 in South Sudan. And, you know, cows are a huge part of, of their lives. So, uh, uh, you know, so this is her, the first cow that I bought for her. She was super happy. Thank you guys for listening. If you have any question at this point, uh, my other co-author will come and then uh, we can uh, answer some questions. Excuse me. Thank you, Aleppo, for sharing with us. Um, so uh, you heard a lot from him about the importance of education, and that's part of why we were so excited to bring him to our campus and to share with so many of our students who are pursuing their own education, their own um, English language improvement. And also maybe many of you have stories of your own that you um, that you would want to write down either in journaling or composition books um, or, or to share with your friends and family. So we're very lucky um, that they have a lot of experience sharing their stories, that they believe in education as much as we do. And so we want to invite um, students now to, or classes, to take the opportunity to ask some questions. So you can use the Zoom features to raise your hand or to type your questions um, into our chat, and then we'll give you an opportunity to ask. So we'll give you a couple minutes to think about doing that. If we don't have any questions, I have a few um, from my students that we will um, share. So. Um, so let's see. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to open this up. Hi, Jose. Thank you for joining us. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Maria, does he want to be unmuted or should we ask the question? Give me one second. Um, sure. Hello, Jose. Oh. If you're able to, are you able to? Uh, Hi, Jose. Hi. Uh, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I just have 
this question, uh, what do you do for a living now? What's your profession? Oh, I work for a, a manufacturing company called Dexcom. It man, uh, we manufactured product for people with diabetes. And so I've, I've worked there like the last four years. I love, I love doing it. You know, I'm a, I'm a coordinator. Well, that, that's awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question, Jose. Hi, Jose, and thank you for having your students join us. If you have any questions or if your students um, would like to ask, we'd love to hear them or read them out loud. Um, I do have a couple of questions that I'll put. So um, one of my students, Karina, asked, um, how did you feel when you arrived in America knowing that you may never see your mother ever again? I was, I was, um, I wasn't confused, but I, I was full of uncertainty, uncertainties, because I didn't know what to expect. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have a lot of experience living in big cities or modern day worlds. As you can see in some of those photos, actually, my life started all over again when I came to uh, the United States. So, um, but one of the greatest thing of coming to US, it has allowed me to actually find my mom because at that time we didn't know where our mother was. So we were able to uh, get jobs, work and collect some money and send some money, hire someone to go look for our mothers in several different refugees camp places, villages. We were, we were lucky to locate her, she's still alive. And so, so that's, a good, that's a good thing, you know, but yeah. So we have a lot of questions mm -hmm. about your family. Mm -hmm. Are you married? I am still single, I'm not married. <laughs> Do you, know. you hope to start a family here in America? I, I would desire that, you know, it's, 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 it's the process. It's something that, you know, you don't force. If it happens, it happens, you know, but sure, yeah. And I, have you been back to the Sudan? To visit? I have, after we found our mother, uh, we went, I went back, you know, for like a month. I got to see my mom. And that was one of the greatest experience as well, but it was also not so good because when I came back, it, the PTSD came back alive and I was, uh, I became super depressed. I didn't know why, because I didn't know what PTSD was at that time. So I had to get some help, um, which was good. You know, that was good when I decided to get some help and uh, and so yeah. yeah thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. yeah don it looks like you might have a question would you like to unmute if they have a question for miss bernstein yeah. as well so don is one of our teachers here okay mm -hmm. hello hello don are you able to unmute um there she goes yeah hi are we are here as a class and um Two questions that were asked in our chat is what is the situation? And I think you have alluded to it already, talked about it um, after after I typed it, but uh, what is the situation in um, Southern Sudan now? And um, your experience as far as getting to see, see your mom again, and you talked about that, but um, yeah. So, um... South Sudan is a, is a country now, the youngest na nation on earth. And uh, they're still going through a lot of struggle. The biggest struggle right now is uh, tribalism. Uh, all these tribes, they seem not to get along. So right after the independence, the, uh, South Sudan was plunged back into the war. You know, they start fighting themselves, uh, uh, which I, I'm sure you've probably heard about it. And uh, they've been working on making peace, peace process right now, but it's not, it's not stable because those tribal fights, they erupted at any time and, you know, but it's what people are used to that, you know, people get killed and all that. 
So I kept my mother in the village. It's a, a little bit safer for her to be in the village than like the towns because sometimes that's where those war actually erupted, you know. So, um, so the situation really, it's, um, it, it, you know, it's full of uncertainties, you know. No, no one knows if they will ever have fully, fully peace uh, or stability, you know. It's like a work, a work in progress, I should say. Thank you for your question, Don. Thank, Thank you. you to your class. Thank you so much. It looks Thank like you for Ingrid. reading the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looks like maybe Ingrid wants to ask a question. Ingrid, are you able to unmute? Can you hear me? Hi, Maria. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, Maria, okay. I see you. I see your message. Nice to meet you today. Thank you for coming and welcoming us in the lobby and telling and telling me your story, telling us your story. That, that was a very powerful story. Go ahead, Ingrid. Okay, so how okay, long okay. Uh, so I'm I'm also a teacher. I teach level four, and um, some of my students are here. We had a little technical issues, so I'm not sure who's here and who's not. <laughs> we have read um, parts of your book, especially the part about your father killing a lion, mm -hmm. and my students love that. And uh, also about your experience in school at the refugee camp. We just mm -hmm. read about why, because I think that was Benson who wrote that chapter. Right. Um, so, because we're learning about how to write because as well in our class. So that was very, <laughs> very funny. Um, right. But our question is this, now where they really wanted to know where Benson is and Benjamin these days. We're glad to see you, of course, but how are mm -hmm. they? Yeah, thank you. Benson is in, he lives in South Dakota and he works there. Uh, Benjamin lives in San Diego. Yeah, he works also, he has a job uh, in, uh, in a company in uh, Miramar. And so once in a while we talk, I, I do talk to Benson at least once a week. Uh, he's doing fine. Uh, he's scheduled, he works six days a week. So he only have one day off uh, and that day he has to clean, cook and prepare to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but they're doing well, they're doing well. Benson, uh, Benson got married last year. He's the first person. And so we're hoping to follow after him, mm -hmm. you know, in the, when we find, you know, Mrs. Wright. Mm -hmm. But for now, I'm working on being Mr. Wright. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paolo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I, think, I appreciate you reading the book, really. I think we have um, Hossein in 106. Hossein, do you want to unmute yourself? I didn't hear that. Hi, Hossein. Can you hear us? Maybe we have some technical difficulties. What about Jose Rodriguez at 120? Yeah. We have a couple of questions in the chat. So if we could just real quick, we have a question from Mia. She said, after arriving to the United States, can you describe your first educational experiences? What experience was most impactful for you? Um, so I um I I went to I went to school. I asked Judy to take us, so she took us to the community college. And uh, I think we, we took a test, assessment test, and that's what places you, uh, you know, in college. And uh, so I, I did that, but I went for like two years and then I dropped out. The reason I dropped out, I was, I was having challenges concentrating because at, that, at this point, I, I started having like so many nightmares and they were like driving me uh, insane, you know? So I didn't really focus uh, very well, even as much as I have desire to further my education. So I decided I'm gonna get some help first. And once I know I, you know, I'm okay, then I'll go back, you know. Um, so when I went back, I just I just went and did the GED. You know, I I, I took I scheduled the test. I got I, I bought the GED book. I read it uh, like a week, 
and then I scheduled the the testing and 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 I passed. You know, I passed, so I got my high school uh, GED certificate. You know, but the college thing is still on the back of my mind. At at some point, I will be able to go back and pursue. Um, I think educational system in the United States it's a uh, it's incredible because if you don't want to go to a school setting and you just read because I love reading, you can still really educate yourself to the maximum. You know, I, I, and uh, reading really helps my writing. You know, uh, a lot because I read other authors and the way they think, and uh, that it impacts my life. You know, reading really impacts my life a lot. It also, it makes me feel good. You know, also, it makes me see that there is something inside me that is also um, of a creativity. You know, have you, uh, have you heard the phrase that uh, the word education comes from Latin word or Greek? Uh, it says, uh, edus, it means to bring forth to bring forth, what are you bringing forth? You know, it's something, there's something that is already inside of you and all you're doing, like, for example, if you want the plant to grow, you have to water it. And because you water the plant, the plant grows. So when I read, it's almost like I'm watering that that thing and then it starts growing, you know, so yeah. I hope everybody heard that, read lots of books. It's a great way to further your education. Do we have, let's see, I'm trying to see if we have any um, questions that we haven't had answered yet. Maria, do you have somebody waiting yes. to unmute? Yes, uh, we have uh, a question from John Bell. Has education improved in Sudan? Another question from level five. I'm sorry, Maria, can you repeat one more time? Has education improved in Sudan? Oh, education in Sudan. Uh, it's, it's a slow process. It's, uh, but it's better than during the civil war, there was no education at all because all the schools were being bombed and burned down. So uh, the most people who got an education was mostly in the refugee camp. Uh, the one that who fled to the refugee camp and the United States provided resources. Uh, those are the people that got education. Now, this new generation, I think they have started schools and they are learning. I honestly, I don't know how strong the education system there is. Uh, it's something that if I do go back to visit, uh, I will explore that, you know, but that's a great question. So I want to take just a second. I think that's a good segue to some questions that we have from my English one class. And I'm going to bring Judy over into my seat. You can stay here. She can come here. Mm -hmm. So as I'm, I'm bringing her back over, we've had a lot of, you know, here we are hearing Alefo's story. And we're, I, I think we're all thinking about how learning his story changes us and opens our mind. So I had some students ask me, you know, Judy, what inspired you to help them write their stories? I think we learned that you were already a writer, but how has it changed you? And everybody wants to know about your son. <laughs> Is he still around? <laughs> Is he still in contact with, with Alefo and the others? So if you could tell us a little bit about the impact on you and the story. Well, I'll start with Clef. Um, he actually lives in D.C. right now, and his wife uh, works for the State Department. So she travels around the world quite a bit. Um, and he's at our house this week and he had COVID. So we were all in different rooms, which is like the third time he's come out and we've all had COVID, but he's doing great. He's 34 now. Um, so what inspired me? Um, you know, I think because I was a reader and so many books had really impacted me. Um, the true story ones, probably the most. Have any of you read Reign of Gold? Have you read Reign of Gold? Mm -hmm. Amazing book. Um, and that was written probably in 1990 by Victor Villasenor. And uh, it was the story of his parents coming up from Mexico and trying to create a new life here in America. And if you haven't read it, it's it's so inspiring and it's just gives you such a 
different perspective, you know, on people that are experienced, their experiences are so different. Um, in the case of uh, Alefo and um, these guys, 20 years ago, they were some of the um, first African refugees to come to San Diego. San Diego is a huge resettlement area, but, you know, people didn't really understand, Americans didn't understand them. They didn't know what they were about. And um, of course, they didn't know all of their story. They didn't know the history. Uh, there was very few history books out about South Sudan. Um, also, hardly anybody knows or knew and still doesn't know that um, us going after the oil under Alefo's village had a lot to do with the war. So, you know, the United States was quite involved um, with South Sudan and a lot of the fighting is still over the oil and oil revenue and who gets it and that sort of thing. So, you know, these stories are really important because they teach us how to be better in the future and how to understand what causes these problems, causes refugees to be displaced. Um, and the thing that makes us care is the personal part. The history is great, but, you know, it's really the human connection um, that changes our hearts and makes us care about what happened in some country that we don't even know where it is on a map. So um, I immediately thought that that's, these stories were just so important. And for all of you out there who, um, all of you have a story, I'm sure, even if you were born here, um, we've all got stories. You know, if you if you want to write your story or um, and nowadays there's so many different ways you don't have to do a book. There's so many things on the Internet that you can do short form, long form, etc. You don't have to have a publisher. Um, you can just get your story out there in so many ways, maybe in video, whatever. It doesn't matter what the medium is. But, you know, think of your story in terms of what what things in your life. Will you never forget, you know, start with those. You don't have to start with the day you were born and go through to the end of your life. It's more like the things that impacted you the most. And that's what I told Alefo and Benson. Don't write, try to write your story in order. Write about the incidents or the things that happened that you'll never forget and what those mean to you now and what you learned from them. That, that's the important aspect of stories. And um, I think it makes it easier to get started. Everyone wants to know how long did it take to write each of the books? Well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing is, so we first wrote a book that um, I kind of write wrote a lot about my experience with them, and they wrote short little things about the big things that had happened in their lives, the way we talked about doing it, and that was about 400 pages. I sent it. We got an agent right away, which was like a miracle. But um, the Lost Boys of Sudan were a little bit famous at that point. They'd been on 60 Minutes, and that that <laughs> helped. Timing is everything. Um, but then the publisher said, oh, we like that book, but we don't want to publish that book. We want you to tell the whole story of Africa. So please start over and write another book. Well, we had spent two years writing the first one. <laughs> so my first reaction was, really? You're kidding. Anyway, I'm so glad that the editor, he was British. I'm so glad he had the insight. And he said, write about the experiences in Africa. So this is all, except for the introduction, this is all by Benson, Alefo, and Benjamin. In their words, what happened um, in Africa. So, advance forward like 12 years. And Alefo said to me, he goes, you know what? I'm finally ready to write about America. Um, and because, you know, when you move to a new culture, that's kind of a whole new set of trauma and stuff, right? Like, <laughs> so he didn't want to write about it for a while. Anyway, and so I went back and I got that stuff that we had written early on, changed it a lot. Alefo wrote his half of his experience coming to America. And so this book, probably took another two years, right? But you know, you're not sitting there at the 
computer writing for two years. It's it's a process. Um, I am in writing groups where we all read to each other, and it's such a great way to learn how to write. You read something, and then people tell you if it's clear, if if, if it moved them, if it's boring. It's a great way to get feedback. So I go through that process a lot myself. So that's how long it took. Um, okay. But anyway, and we do have another question. That I'm going to come in, come into yeah. view, so I'm not talking from outer <laughs> space. Um, Judy just spoke to us about point of view. So if you haven't read the second book, one of the nice things about it is that they tell us stories from each of their points of view. So you may hear about the first time that Alefo went to Walmart um, and how impressed he was with all of the goods that are in this big <laughs> store. And then you hear about Walmart from Judy's perspective as an American who has been to that store many times and knows all of the other stores she could have taken them to. Um, so it's really interesting to hear. And I, I say that because I wanna segue to what I think is a wonderful question. From both of your points of view, if you could each take a moment, you shared with us that there are some similarities to what's happening in Ukraine. As a refugee from a country facing war and, and strife, and be, becoming a refugee, what in your opinion or perspective could people like us do to support the refugees in that country? In what ways would you have liked to have been supported or, or is what you got wonderful? And also from your perspective, having been this person that then got to have this experience, what is your perspective on support for refugees? Well, I for me, I think uh, getting to know uh, someone's story. So, for for example, when when I meet someone and I I don't know the way they do things, I don't understand. Uh, instead of me saying uh, that's weird the way they do, you know, or that's strange, you know, I use the the term like I wonder. I wonder why they do things this way, uh, and and the reason I wonder is because. I don't know their story. I want to know, get to know them first. Because when, when we get to know each other's story, you, we begin to realize we're not actually too different. Uh, you know, humanity is still, we have the same, we go through the same challenges, the same struggles as, as human beings. Even though we come from different culture, we just, and we learn to deal with those problems differently. So I would say, uh, from my perspective, once people get to know other people's stories, then they are able to feel compassion for them. They're also able to understand how to best help them, you know, instead of uh, uh, objectifying, you know, that, that particular group of people that, you know, they're like this, they're like that. So it started with like learning an individual's story like what happened between me and Judy, when we got to know each other's stories, all of a sudden it, it did change her, it also changed me. And we've been in this uh, partnership or relationship for like 20 years and we have never had problems. You know, I may have my personal problems as, as, a, as a human being, she may have some, but we, our collaboration has worked so well because we understand each other's story. We also understand the connection, we also understand the power and the impact of an individual story. That's what I would say to that. Thank you. Perfect. I do have a comment that I wanted to share and then another question from a student. Uh, so a comment came from Hussein's class. Uh, they share, although you have had a hard life, your resilience has helped you succeed. Thank you very much for sharing your story. And we also have a question from Jocelyn Perez. I'm gonna go ahead and read her message. She mentions, thank you so much for having the courage to share your personal story with us. You're an inspiration and an example of how resilience can help us move through life experiences. Our youth today are experiencing more anxiety and fear and often feel unseen, unheard, and overwhelmed. What words of wisdom would you share with others on how to get through tough life situations? Well, when, when I was... Uh dealing with the civil war and I didn't know where I was gonna get my next meal. I didn't know if I was gonna be dead the next day or the day after. Uh, 
So I, I always convince myself. Sometimes we would want to, uh, we would be on a walk for like days, you know, no food, no water, uh, and uh, I've seen some boys who give up. You know, they just go lay down, and they get left behind. Sometimes they're eaten by a wild animal. But what I did at that time, I always use some mental tricks. Um, fear can be a good thing. Uh, when you have fear, it can kind of drive you to the to the maximum. Uh, you know, it can it kind of pushes you to actually find out what you're made of. And so the metal trick I use, I always convince myself. I say, you know what? I'm just going to try to go from point A to point B. Once I get there, I'm going to give up. You know. So once so I and then I do that. So I, I get there. To tell myself another story, you know. So the power of like inward story, telling yourself your story in, inside. No one knows what you're thinking, but you are telling yourself a story inside that tell that you convince yourself. Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be like a motivation. It can just be like, you know what? I'm just gonna try. Instead of just giving in or giving up, I'm just going to keep trying. I'm just going to keep trying. And in doing so, I was able to make it through a lot of uh, bad situations, you know. And uh, I, 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 it still plays a role today when I'm about to give up uh, even doing something in, in this uh, wonderful society that I lived in. I, I, I still tell myself a story, and you know, in a story that convinced me. I remember when I got the job at Dexcom. I um, I wanted to quit the same day, you know. It, it, it was a lot to learn. It was overwhelming, and also was challenging. You know, I'm not very good with technology, with computers, so it was so much that I was it was coming at me. So I I said I'm just going to look for another job. You know, I'm going to quit. You know, so the first thing I did first I called Judy. You know, yeah. Um, uh, this is another technique too. When you're going through something, always, if you cannot solve that problem yourself, try to calling someone else for help. You know, me, I always ask for help. I have no problem with that, you know. And help always came. That's the thing too. That's another thing. Um, so I called Judy. Judy, you know, kind of talked me in, into, like, just give it a week, you know. And, uh, and, and surely uh, I gave it a week. And, uh, and then I... After a week, the job became super easy. And I was remember like, I almost quit for nothing. You know, so when you're under the pressure of something, it's so it's so easy to convince yourself, you know, to say, you know what, you know, I'm leaving. I'm just leave and you just give up. But the the string is the your string come after you don't give up. That's when your string come. Your string doesn't, your string actually comes because you have a weakness once you have a weakness and you stay through that weakness then you develop a strength you know so i don't know if i have answered your question but that was a great question yeah thank you thank you thank you Those... judy is there something you wanted to respond to one of the questions that we asked um yeah. i asked about the yes. refugees as you're watching oh. the, the situation with ukraine what can you do with, yeah. So, um, well, if you have a million dollars, you can donate, but most people <laughs> don't have that. And uh, so, you know, what can you do? Well, a lot of people come um, to San Diego. Uh, actually, a lot of Ukrainians have come. Um, a lot of you are students, you're, you know, you're not in a position, you've got families, you're busy, you don't have a spare hour in the week, you know, to do too much. But you know, in general, what we can all do is what Alefa was saying, and that is not objectify people, you know, open our hearts and our minds to new people, people who are different, they might be struggling, they may not seem friendly the way we are, or um, that sort of thing. But, you know, to just maybe try to understand their point of view and their story a little bit just really helps everybody so i would say um unless you're blessed with time or money um 
And believe me, you'll get plenty in return, like I did, um, getting to know Alefo and with other refugees I've worked with since then. Um, it, you know, it's all about attitude. And uh, we all, you know, we can always all improve our attitudes. And so I would say that would be the best thing you can do right now. Re and read. Read, yeah, I'm just read, gonna read. Say, so one of the <laughs> things that we heard Alefo say was, I approach everything with wonder. I wonder what it's like for that person. I wonder what what they're going through. I wonder what I'm capable of. Um, and also read books because one of the ways you can help fill in the wonder is to learn about mm -hmm. each other and to create community. So part of that is why we're here today with this reading festival. Um, you may never have heard of the Lost Boys for as popular as they were for a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, you're learning something new, something historic and something impactful, something that is teaching us about humanity and about life. They're taking us on a journey in their in their writing um, and showing us experiences and cultures um, and hardships that we may be fortunate enough to never experience, um, but certainly learning about them can help improve our lives, improve our humanity, and help us um, continue to wonder. So um, we have just uh, two more minutes. Mm -hmm. If there are any question. um, questions, we do get a lot of um, thank you. writing one there. Yeah, let's see if we can scroll down a little bit here. Or Judy, where is it? Are there any, yeah, there's some questions about some of the hardships being faced in other countries. Specifically yeah. about the Republic of Iran. Yeah. You know, um, it's hard to tell you where to start with that stuff because depending on, you know, what you're familiar with in terms of um, platforms and and speaking out, there's so many options these days, you know, um, and so many mediums, whether it's writing, speaking, videos, etc. cetera. Um, but using our voice, I mean, those are all opportunities to use our voice and speak out against in, injustices wherever they might be. And um, I'm a big believer in that. Um, sometimes I think it can be more effective to create empathy than it can to be to preach or, or lecture, because we just end up doing this. Whereas, as Alefa was saying, you know, maybe we look at each other like, okay, that's really strange the way you do that. But in the end, it might be that we're really wanting and trying to achieve the same thing. So um, I think that's, again, why sharing actual personal stories can be a little bit more of an inroad than um, just like politics, political positions. Yeah. So I want to take this opportunity to bring our, our session to a close. I think that what we've heard is one of the things that we can do to help inform ourselves is to read more. And then I also just want to say thank you to Judy. Um, I think that she's shown us how powerful mentorship is, um, how important it is for all of us to have someone in our life that we can turn to for support in our moments of both weakness and strength. Um, and those people might come from within your education system. So you might have a teacher that you really um, look up to and that really cares for you or someone in your community or someone that, that has been brought into your life. So um, I wanna say thank you to everyone. Our Dean there, John Makovich has said, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. So thank you to all the students. Um, we will have this recording posted to our um, events um, webpage, and also we will be inviting them back tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. We will have the honor of bringing them into a full space where um, students can come and meet them in person if you'd like to do that. So please check the Reading Festival flyer for our event tomorrow at 1030. Um, and in closing, just thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy and Alepo, for thank being you. here. Thank you, everybody. And have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank good you. Good night.